Amy Sullivan, and I'm the chair of the AAAR Endowment Committee. I wanted to welcome you to our second in our monthly series of AS&T paper lecture series talks. Um, this is a new initiative for AAAR being sponsored by the Freelander Memorial Fund. With this initiative, we hope to um, be able to highlight the excellent research happening in our community, tie our journal to other activities at AAAR, and also provide us an opportunity to all get together outside of the annual conference. So each month, um, a paper selected by the editors of AS&T will be presented by its author. And in addition, we'll have one of our student chapters um, hosting the seminar. Um, the student chapters have also created a journal club, so students look out for announcement for that each month. Um, and I wanted to thank everyone who's helped in coordinating these activities. And I also thank you all for joining us. And so with that, I'll turn it over to our student chapter um, at Colorado State University. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Um, hi, my name is Samuel O'Donnell. I'm a master's student at Colorado State University. And um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, uh, Alexander Free. Um, Ale a brief introduction. Um, Alex received um, his bachelor's from St. John's University um, and the College of St. Benedict in 2015, and then proceeded to get a PhD from the University of California, Riverside. And his dissertation was entitled Studies on the Sources and Properties of Natural and Anthropogenic Aerosols. Um, with that, uh, he has a whole host of uh, lab, exp lab uh, experience and um, a broad range of uh, research on chemistry and the environment. So um, with that, uh, I'll let you take it over. Thanks, Sam, for the introduction. Um, and thanks to AAAR and AST um, for inviting us for this talk today um, and CS, you know, the CSU student chapter um, for hosting us. Um, I think everybody can hear me, so I think we're good. I know. Okay, good, great. Um, today I'm going to talk to talk a little bit about our paper, um, the Refractive Index Confidence Explorer. Um, it's a tool um, for propagating uncertainties through complex refractive indexes um, from aerosol particles. Um, and let me make it so I don't have to see myself so much. Um, yeah, so this research kind of stems from this foundational graph. Um, so this is something a lot of us use in kind of our grant proposals and such. Um, this is the graph that's put up by the ICPC, P, IPCC um, that talks about the components of radiator forcing in the atmosphere. So on the top, we see greenhouse gases here. And then down here, we see the aerosol components. And so one thing to note here is the error bars in these aerosol components um, are quite large. And so these error bars stems from uncertainty and in inputs such as what the size distribution of these aerosols are, um, what the composition is are, what emissions are, um, what they might be in the future um, and what they are today, as well as fundamental understanding of aerosol physical properties, such as the refractive index of aerosols. And so the refractive index of aerosols is simply the quantity that describe the fundamental quantity that describes how um, a material interacts with radiation. So generally we think of this um, being defined by the equation M equals N plus K, N plus K. And so when aerosols interact with radiation, like they do on this little right panel here, um, if we have some incident light, for example, coming from, I'm sorry, coming from the sun, um, some of that light can be transmitted through um, that aerosol population. And so we can think of that um, as, for example, like putting a laser through a cloud of smoke, even um, through a thick cloud of smoke, we usually some, have some transmitted light. Um, but we can also have light that can undergo extinction processes um, that are de um, described by these terms N and K. And so the first process that we'll discuss here is the scattering of light. And so this is simply the redirection of light. So in an atmospheric context, we generally think of this as a cooling process. So you can think if we have solar radiation that's incident, um, it interacts with aerosol, uh, with an aerosol, and then some of that is no longer moving towards the Earth's surface, um, we can think of it as cooling when we think of top of the atmosphere radiator forcing. And we generally think of this as being described um, by this, end, this real component um, of the refractive index. Refractive index also has this K or sometimes called kappa component of um, this, uh, the imaginary component. Um, this is thought, this controls absorption. 
And so that's the actual physical transformation of radiation um, into heat within the particles itself. So as those heat particles heat up, um, they then heat the atmosphere. So when we talk about top of the atmosphere radiative forcing, this is considered a heating process usually. So when we're attempting to understand kind of future climate scenarios or current climate scenarios, um, it's important to understand the radiative budget as well as the contribution of aerosols. So generally, um, how the aerosol direct effects are modeled are by using a assumed a priori refractive index for different compositions um, and then using a particle radiation model. Um, so to understand, so having a good and confident um, conception of what the refractive index is are of different aerosol components, for example, organic aerosols um, or brown carbon or black carbon um, or dust is really key to kind of modeling these actual particle radiation effects as they occur in the atmosphere. And so for it's a little maybe easier to um, understand some aerosol or the refractive indexes of bulk materials that are similar in the bulk as they are in aerosol, for example, some of the more salt like materials, but for things like organic aerosols, um, where we know they're quite reactive and dynamic, um, you can't simply put these into a bulk material, you can't make like a surface with them and measure how light travels through them. Um, we need to rely on in situ methods where we actually attempt to retrieve an aerosol ref or refractive index from the aerosol itself um, while it's suspended. So there's been quite a bit of work that use refractive indexes as endpoints in the literature. And so these have looked at specifically for um, organic aerosols, which are kind of um, where we're coming from when we develop this tool. And then looking at how optical properties in refractive indexes change in regards to aging um, as they move through the atmosphere um, under for different exposure to oxidants. So is it ozone? Is it nitrate? Is it hydroxyl oxidation? Or different precursors looking at the different optical properties that are coming um, through different SOA formation processes, um, as well as different sources on a more complex scale, um, different NOx levels, different ammonia, um, and different humidity. So all of these, um, there's been a quite a large breadth of studies that have used refractive indexes as endpoints to kind of understand how aerosol optical properties change and they will change under different conditions um, with different sources. And so part of the reason why people are typically interested in aerosol optical properties compared to maybe um, quantities like the mass absorption coefficient or MAC is because theoretically um, refractive index values should be size independent. So there should be a material property, kind of an intensive property of that material. And so if you have a good radiation particle um, model and you know the refractive index confidently, um, you can then extrapolate to different um, aerosol size distributions um, in different parts of the atmosphere with how they'll interact with radiation. So one of the most common um, particle radiation models that's used is me theory, which describes um, how spherical particles interact with radiation kind of in the nanometer or micrometer range. And so generally we can think of me theory applies when the particle diameter is on a similar scale um, to the wavelength. So um, I think hundreds of nanometer particles, hundreds of nanometer wavelength. Um, that's generally where our um, aerosols, um, sorry, lie. But again, we're a little bit limited by the major assumptions of particle homogeneity and um, sphericity. So the methods that I'm gonna discuss a bit today um, are gonna specifically look at um, applications of me theory to actually attempt to infer the nature of the refractive index from aerosol populations. So these methods are called inverse me methods. Um, the simplest way to present them um, is kind of looking at, is asking the question is what are the optical properties that we observe for a given aerosol population? Um, and then we compare them to what me theory calculates for a given particle diameter, wavelength, and refractive index. And so if we do this over a large, um, large series of refractive indexes, um, we can then look at which refractive indexes predict best what we observe given those inputs of particle size distribution. And then we can say this is, should be the refractive index of these particles based on this theory. And so that's the general concept of how an inverse mean method works. There's a few different applications of this method in the literature. One, there's some that include um, that look at diff multiple different sizes, sizes or minor dispersed distributions. So where you're selecting for a specific diameter and then you're measuring the optical on um, the absorption in scattering that you observe for that specific aerosol population, you do that at multiple diameters. Um, and then you fit, um, again, looking at multiple refractive indexes to see which best fits all of those different diameters that you observed. We also have this full distribution method, and that's the one we're gonna be focusing on today, where you take a scan um, of particle diameter, or sorry, particle diameter number concentration. Um, so you have a 
essentially what can be considered quote unquote a full size distribution, usually spanning the nanometer range, so um, nanometer to micrometer range. And then you take the optical properties you, you observe for that whole size distribution um, for scattering absorption, you compare it to what you predict for that whole size distribution, again, using me theory. And then you can also potentially look at the phase function. So this is looking at the angle dependence of scattering. Um, how, wh where is that actually scattering going relative to the incident light? Um, it seem a little bit less common now, um, but were common in the early 2000s. So there's a few different methods here. We're gonna focus in on this full distribution method here. So how generally when people apply this full distribution method, they work, they have a few different inputs. So they have these um, particle diameter bins. So um, DP, they have number concentrations as well as a series of um, refractive index values that they're gonna test to see if they match the observations. Um, and the, that those are where they're gonna pull um, that retrieved refractive index from. Um, you as well have, have your absorption coefficient, which represents the integrated absorption from an aerosol, and as well as the scattering coefficient, which represents the integrated scattering observed for an aerosol. So when we have these inputs, um, we then take that list of test refractive indexes, we combine it with that observed size distribution, and we predict um, over, the, over these series of M, um, M tests what the theoretical absorption and scattering coefficients should be. And so now we have a range of M tests and a range of absorption and scattering coefficients um, that we can now compare to these observations to get towards a retrieved value. So in the calculations we use, we have a few reasonability criteria that throw out, um, that throw out M tests, for example, that have theoretical optical coefficients that are, for example, two um, standard deviation away from the observation um, based on the optical property uncertainty of the observations. Um, but generally, most of these are going to be eliminated when we apply a merit parameter. Um, so this can be, for example, the difference from the observation or using a chi-squared method where we do a little bit more complex calculations. Um, and all, all of the M tests, but a single one, are going to be thrown out and then, or not selected, and we're going to select a single um, M test that's going to choose as our MR or retrieve refractive index. And so in some cases, this is considered the refractive index of the particles. For example, if we know that all the um, assumptions of me theory are met, as well as the assumptions um, of inverse me methods, which we're applying here. So again, this full distribution method, um, here we need an aerosol size distribution. So we need DP and N over a range of um, particle diameters. Um, we need scattering coefficients. So we need a measure of scattering um, at the given wavelength. And we need a measure of absorption at a given wavelength. Um, we have some assumptions here, and I believe I have a slight mistake here, but we do have a, the assumption with me theory that all particles are kind of internally homogeneous. There's not, um, for, or for the code that we're applying here, we're not, um, we're assuming that these particles are the same all the way through compositionally. Um, we're assuming that these particles are well mixed in, um, internally. Um, we're also assuming that all particles share refractive index. So for example, if you had a um, an ambient mixture of black carbon and organic carbon, this method may not be the would likely not be applicable. Um, and then again, we're assuming that these particles are spherical um, in order for these methods to give something that you could actually report as a refractive index. So part of the reason that we really were interested in this is, um, is to help understand the uncertainty with these results when people do these retrievals. And so the reasons why we need a specific tool for this um, is because the uncertainty for refractive index retrievals um, is dynamic um, because of two things. The first thing is what we've termed solution dependence. Sim that's is simply the idea that the uncertainty of the retrieval or that output refractive index is gonna depend on the actual refractive index that we retrieved. And so one way to think of this, a simple way, another system that will have solution dependent is simply any um, system that you say it has plus or minus 5% uncertainty. You're saying that the magnitude of uncertainty is 5% um, of whatever your solution is. In this case, we can't assume that the uncertainty will vary linearly um, with, the, with the refractive index that's retrieved. Instead, we're, we have to kind of, we, ha we have to um, measure independently for each point what the solution and um, condition dependent uncertainty will be. So why do we have this uh, unique uncertainty conditions for each um, refractive index retrieval? So that's kind of, if we look at this graph on the right, um, on the bottom we have size parameter, which is um, proportional to the ratio of wavelength um, and diameter. And then on the left side we have um, the extinction coefficient, um, or extinction efficiency of, of given particle. Um, here, which is simply the amount for these cases, because these are purely scattering particles in these graphs, so it's just n okay, um, the amount of scattering relative to the particle, particle area. 
So if we look, for example, at um, size parameter equals two and n equals one, um, we can think that, okay, if we have some uncertainty in that size parameter, um, there, the slope of how that efficiency changes with uncertainty um, would be much higher, than, for example, than if it changes if we move down to here where it's um, in this pink line where n equals 1.33. And so how sensitive um, a given retrieval is to the input uncertainty in diameter um, or in the optical coefficient uncertainty is going to be dependent on actually refractive index that you're retrieving. So we need to find a way to estimate this uncertainty um, for the specific retrieval that we're working with. Um, we also have what we've termed condition dependence. And so this does, um, these are not completely unique quantities. You couldn't isolate one or the other. But condition dependence is the idea that um, not only does the refractive index that you retrieve um, con help contribute to the uncertainty, but also the size distribution you're using for that retrieval contributes to that uncertainty. And that's because if we look at this, like for example, size distribution here, um, where it lies in kind of, if we were to transpose these graphs on this um, efficiency graph, um, you can imagine that for a different size distribution, um, there'd be quite different efficiencies that match up with the diameters. And so where these diameters lie um, relative to these curves of um, scattering and absorption efficiencies um, will determine how uncertainties in those scattering and absorption as well as diameter diameters propagate through these retrievals. So as you can imagine, this is not a trivial um, matter. So this is why we took this approach to kind of build the tool to help us understand the uncertainties um, in refractive indexes from this method. So other methods of estimating uncertainty. So one thing you can think of is kind of probably a typical approach for many methods is to just measure a known standard, for example, ammonium sulfate or ammonium nitrate, um, where we have um, a no relatively good comprehension of what the refractive index should be. Um, and we measure that multiple times. Um, multiple times and we have maybe 1.4 plus or minus um, 0 0.4 for n. Um, but um, what we just learned is we have these solution condition dependent uncertainties. So methods like that, if we were to change the refractive index of what we're um, trying to retrieve from, we may no longer be accurate. Again, um, the same thing with size distribution. If we change the size distribution we're using a retrieval, um, we change how those uncertainties will propagate through this calculation. Um, secondly, they also have um, techniques that try to min max, kind of use a min max method where you take some of these, um, you take the calculations and you say, okay, we know the optical property uncertainty has a um, plus or minus 5%. So we're going to perturb the inputs to the calculation by 5% up or 5% down and look at how much that changes the retrieve value. So this is perhaps a good quick idea value, um, idea, a quick idea method, um, but there's not a huge um, statistical robustness for reporting this as a statistically relevant value. Um, and then there's also Monte Carlo and sensitivity based at me uh, methods that kind of try to perturb the inputs again um, and look at how much that changes the outputs of these calculations, which is similar to what we'll be doing, um, although um, by doing it on every single input here. So why do we need a robust uncertainty estimation for this technique? Um, because we know that these have relative from what I've just mentioned, these have relatively constrained uncertainty when people are applying them um, in the literature. And we know that these measurements are potentially applied in mo models and it's good to have um, w solid and confident reported um, uncertainty values that have physical meaning um, or at least some statistical meaning um, when we're reporting them in the literature. So our goal here is to provide a statistically robust technique for estimating uncertainties associated with those refractive index retrievals. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the details of what we actually present in the paper. And so we've termed this RICE on Refractive Index Confidence Explorer. So RICE estimates the uncertainties that um, in a retrieved M by testing nearby refractive index values for the ability to produce the original refractive index um, value with perturbed inputs. So that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, this next line is kind of the one sentence version. So it asks if, if an M that, if, if a refractive index was true, could it have yielded the refractive index that we observed? And so by asking this, um, if it was, could it have question, um, lots of times for, multi, for lots of refractive indexes that are nearby the one we retrieved, um, we can start to get an idea of how likely it is that other refractive indexes retrieve the value that we observe in a given retrieval. Um, RICE is a series of Igor, um, Igor Pro procedures. It should function in Igor Pro 6, 7, 8, 9, or 6, 7, and 8, not 9. I don't think 9 exists. Um, and um, sorry, and there's a, there, it's on GitHub, so you, it's freely available to anybody who wants to download it and try to use it themselves. 
So how do we actually perform this if it was, would it, could it have um, calculations in order to get um, statistically relevant ranges? So Rice, um, the operator is going to input into Rice a re retrieve refractive index using um, a retrieval similar to one that we that I just walked you through. Um, there is a retrieval built into that code um, that's downloadable, as well as the size distribution associated with that retrieval in their measurement uncertainties associated with their optical coefficients in size distribution. Rice is then going to take these values and determine an initial sampling space um, where it thinks those values um, that potentially could have given you the retrieved values um, might be. And so these are going to be described by these terms k width and n width. And so that's just going to say within this range, we think most of the probable refractive indexes that could have given us that retrieved value should lie. And again, right now, this is just an initial guess. Um, using this initial guess, we're going to select again these potentially true refractive indexes um, that we're going to treat as if they um, if they were, could they have, if they were true, could they have given us a true refractive index. And using those and for, for a certain number of iterations, in this case, for looking at the sampling space, um, a small number of iterations, so for 10, um, we're going to perform a perturbed refractive index retrieval 10 times and look at how, what the outputs are for these given, um, for these um, M true inputs. And so what this actually looks like in process, um, if we have an input size distribution here um, that looks like this, we're going to take it and say, okay, well, maybe um, given the diameter bin location uncertainty, we're going to do a small perturbation for um, a given iteration, um, which is going to move the size bins up or down slightly based on that uncertainty. Um, for, the, for the bin location, we do this um, by the same value or the same relative value for all bins um, and in the same direction, because if we were to do it randomly for each bin, we could have non-sequential bins, which is not a realistic um, thing that can occur. And then we apply number concentration uncertainty to each bin randomly and say, okay, um, now if, if this could potentially be what maybe the true size distribution actually was. I mean, it's unlikely given the spikiness of it, um, but in this particular case, but if we say this could be a potential true, true size distribution, knowing our uncertainties of our observations, um, we can then take this and use it in combination with me theory and those values we want to test to see if they could have given us our true value to predict optical coefficients using me theory here. Um, we can then say, what if we observed these optical coefficients using our instruments? And so again, they're going to have uncertainty. Um, so we then perturb them one more time. And then we can take these and put them back into our original inverse mean method calculation. And so that's gonna give us um, a refractive index for each iteration that's associated with each one of these M true again. If, so now we know for each M true, if this M true was um, true, kind of a, a distribution of um, retrieve refractive indexes we could have seen for each one of those. And then we can zoom in on specifically that value that we would like to retrieve, so that original MR, um, and do a small probability calculation here. So focusing on this equation, this is the probability that um, this was, if n true, so, the, or, so this is looking at just the real component here, and um, this n was the true, um, assuming or if we um, retrieved that n, retrieved refractive index n. And so and that's equal to the number of times we retrieved that n um, for these per perturbed cases for given this n true over the total number of times any of these n true gate um, retrieved um, that NR. So the assumption here is that we sampled all, but the space that includes all potential um, true refractive indexes, or all potential refractive indexes that could have given us this retrieval under these uncertainty conditions. Um, and so we don't know that for sure. Um, so now we're going to move back into this flow chart here. Um, and then we're going to check some fit parameters that I'm not going to go too far into detail here in this talk. Um, and we're just going to see, okay, does this make sense? Does this space that we're looking at, this K width and N width that we're using to, um, to construct these M true values, does it seem to contain all probable values or not? I mean, are these all giving us giving us that MR value at least once? If so, maybe that doesn't make sense because we want this to include the edges um, or are none of them giving it to us? Maybe we have to zoom in a little bit. So um, it's gonna loop through this process, looking at the sampling space here using parameters that we've tuned um, that seem to give us a good, um, if it does this a few times, we're actually able to find a good sampling space kind of in the normal typical effective index range. And then once we believe we found a sampling space that includes most of the, or all, most to all of the refractive indexes that could have given us, that had some probability of giving us this retrieved value, um, we then up the number of iterations here and move back into that perturbed calculation. 
and do this again, we're increasing the number of iterations so we can get a more statistically robust answer um, within the sampling space that we believe includes all most probable values. And so we're going to use those um, results again to create a probability distribution from those probabilities that we calculate. So walking through this graph here, on the left, we have the cumulative probability. So again, this is going to go up left from right um, by the cumulative probability that anything happened to the left of it. Each one of these dots is one of those discrete n true values um, that could have given us um, that m true that we were interested in. And then the blue line is the sigmoidal fit of the probability there. So once we have this, so this is, we can think of this as an empirical, a kind of a semi-empirical probability distribution where we did um, a lot of different tests using perturbed inputs and outputs um, with those potentially true refractive indexes to see how, if they could have given us this retrieved value and then we made a probability distribution from it. And using that probability distribution, we can draw out a confidence interval at some width. So for example, we can draw, we take the lower value at 2.5% um, and the upper value at 90, um, 98.5, 97.5%, sorry. Um, then we can draw 95% um, confidence interval. We can kind of say um, n should be plus or minus this based on the retrieval for this one instance. And that's the kind of the general gist at a high level um, what we're looking at for rice. Okay, and then we also, so in the paper, we also apply rice to um, a few um, simulated examples. We also do some validation work as well, um, but I'm not gonna go, or just validation work for the retrieval um, to compare it to some other retrievals in the literature and generally the refractive index retrieval that we're using matches well with what some other values in the reporting literature are using their inputs. Um, so we wanna test now to see kind of how reproducible rice is um, and can we see any of these unique sources of uncertainties we expect to propagate through um, through these vector index retrievals when we look at some simulated results. So we look at a kind of a series of K, K and M values here, K and N values, sorry, um, that's correspond to kind of generally what we expect to see in aerosols. 0 0.5 might be quite large for what we expect to see for organic aerosol, but maybe you might see something in something like black carbon, um, still quite high. Um, and then we take these somewhat typical instrumental uncertainties, 3% for particle bin diameter, 10% um, for number concentration, and 5% for the scattering coefficients. And then just to see how reproducible the result, results from rice are, we're gonna run rice in triplicate. So in the paper, we did this over seven, seven different size distributions um, to kind of get representative statistics, um, but we're only gonna kind of really delve into two here. And so these are two size distributions that we're performing these on. Um, so the one on the left red here is what we call the urban low size distribution. That's just a trimodal, kind of represents a lower concentration. I mean, it's relative concentration, so it's not particularly relevant. And then the one on the right, is in the green is kind of a chamber simple something we modeled after something we just observed from an SOA formation experiment in our chamber. So this is what those kind of results end up looking like when we take in um, look, use these two different size distributions. So I know this graph, sorry, um, has quite a bit um, going on in it. So I'm going to walk it, hopefully walk it through you, walk through, walk you through it in a way that helps you make sense of it. So on the left, we're gonna have this 95% confidence interval with, and so this is gonna be the half width. So you think N plus or minus this value um, is what you would have for N here. On the bottom value, we have the N of, kind of that retrieved value that we input into rice. So um, 1.4 in this column here, 1.6 in this column here, and 1.8 in this column. And then we have color coding by the K value. So you can say, okay, we're gonna look at the 1.8 um, blue would be one point, um, M equals 1.8 um, plus K plus 0.1 I um, is what the refractive index would be in that case. And then we just have the shape here, which shows if we're having that chamber simple or urban low size distribution. So the other thing we have here are these um, uncertainty bars, or so they're not, or the kind of reproducibility is what these um, standard deviation bars, these are the standard deviation of running rice three times. And so rice is stochastic, so we expect it to be not perfectly. Um, reproducible, but one thing we can look at, if we look at these kind of red dots here, we see that we have quite large uncertainty bars specifically for those cases, um, which implies that when K is quite high, um, rice seems to not do quite as well job of giving consistent uncertainty results. Um, and so in that maybe because of the assumption that maybe nearest neighbor um, refractive indexes may not be the ones that are likely to give it or that there's just 
a lot, maybe infinite values I could have given you, maybe not infinite, that's unlikely. Um, but so because of this, we do recommend when running rights, you run it in triplicate, um, as well as view, view some of the error flags um, to make sure you're not running in a, um, a region where it's not giving quite as robust results. So now we can look at these results and we can say, okay, can we see any of these um, types of uncertainty um, that we hope that rice can capture here? like that solution dependent uncertainty. So if we just look at these purple boxes, so that is um, the K equals 0 0.001 for the chamber simple size distribution. We can see that as we can change N, um, so we change the solution, um, we actually see that the, that the confidence interval size increases. And so this makes some intuitive sense as we get to higher ends, um, we should have a little bit larger um, uncertainty size, um, but this is a good example of rice actually being able to um, constrain these. Um, and then we can see the same thing again here um, if we look at one for this urban well. So it seems like Rice is able to capture some of this um, solution dependent uncertainty. And we can also look and say, okay, um, can Rice capture condition dependent uncertainty? So not simply dependent on, we use two different size distributions for these retrievals. Um, are, is there different uncertainty conditions? And we can just look down here um, and you can see that between this box and this, this blue box and this blue dot, um, they seem to be quite different here um, and as well as look over here at this purple box and purple dot. And that applies that the differences between this um, chamber simple and this urban low size distribution are enough to cause differences in the um, retrieval uncertainty. And so that's really um, the per one of, the, I mean, that's really why we want to use rice here so we can get an idea of how much these different size distributions are contributing to uncertainty for each given retrieval. So you can then use these inverse mean methods in a bit more dynamic systems. So now we're gonna look at almost the same graph, but again, this is now K confidence interval on the left. So again, that's the half width of the confidence interval. And then the K value as columns in the bottom and then the N value and colors on the right. And so this one is a little bit less um, busy than the N value graph, but we can definitely see um, again, something that's pretty intuitive, but it's nice to see it in the data as well, um, that as we increase K, there seems to be um, an increase in the K uncertainty associated with um, increases in K. Um, and so we do have solution dependent uncertainty that Rice is able to capture here um, and propagate those input uncertainties in absorption and scattering and particle diameter and particle number um, through this calculation. Um, it's a little bit harder to see condition dependent uncertainties to this graph because we're going over a large scale, um, but even between, for example, um, if you were to look at um, the blue box here and the blue dot there, um, they seem to have quite different uncertainty sizes. So we seem to see both solution dependent and condition dependent uncertainty in both of these cases. Um, we also did a comparison in the paper where we looked at what did what are these confidence intervals that we're producing? How do they compare to one of these min-max methods where we're just trying to get a ballpark idea of how sensitive um, these um, N and K are to the uncertainties. And so we get put kind of plus or minus one standard deviation of the optical coefficients into the calculation um, and do it. And so what we can see here is, especially for N, um, there's really not a great um, relationship between what we're, what Rice is outputting um, for these 95% confidence intervals um, in what the min-max method was giving us. And so what this seems to imply is that this min-max method is maybe not um, giving us great robust results and great understanding of the uncertainty associated with our uh, measurements in many cases. Um, and then on the right, we have that same graph for K. Um, and we can see that kind of over these three orders of magnitude, there seems to be some um, good relationship. But if, for example, in a specific um, order of magnitude, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of reproducibility here um, in that um, in kind of straight linear relationship. So generally, this says that this min-max method seems to be not quite representative of what the actual uncertainties may be for an inverse mean method and refractive index retrieval. So Rice is built to be relatively easy to use. Um, so we built a very simple, hopefully simple GUI um, that you can operate it through um, just a drop down menu that comes from Eager Pro. It'll walk you through the inputs um, and then it will run. Um, it does take about 10 minutes per time point um, kind of under ideal conditions. So it's not super fast. Um, and so there's a few drawbacks to using Rice. So again, um, we, we do drop a few of the diameter bins to increase analysis time. So um, we look at how much each um, diameter bin seems to be contributing to the overall absorption and scattering. And then we look at, and then we perform rice on the ones that seem to be most important. So there's some ignoring of some smaller bins, some less important bins. Um, and again, we seem to have 
about 10 minutes per time point is an approximate use for to run this code. So if you're running a chamber experiment once a day, that's likely fine if you have um, 100 time points or something like that. But if you start to run this, if you wanted to run RICE um, in tandem, for example, with real time measurements, um, and this would um, fall behind essentially because your size distribution measurements are usually on the order of three or four minutes. Um, and then all the assumptions that are built into RICE um, are built into me theory are now in any inverse me method are now built into the RICE. So that means that we should be a little bit cautious where inverse me methods should and shouldn't be used. Um, we don't really want to apply these to non-spherical aerosol systems without any without caution and, or non-well mixed aerosol systems. Um, there's some cases where people have re, um, kind of used inverse me methods in the field. Um, reported, for example, effective refractive index, um, but we can't necessarily know that these will be applicable if we try to predict, for example, in a radiative model. Um, the aerosol direct effect because um, there may be effects that aren't just coming from the refractive index, but instead from the differing composition or differing particle shape. Um, these. So in conclusion, um, RICE provides a statistically robust method for propagating uncertainties through refractive index calculations. Um, we can see here that the uncertainties in inverse mean methods seem to be a direct function of those input, input uncertainties. Um, and so if we want to get better ideas of what um, get more confident retrievals willing to reduce those input uncertainties. And then we can use RICE to kind of understand how much those reductions help us in the certainty in the results. And then again, um, these, me, these inverse mean methods in RICE are particularly suited to um, aerosols that are, we can believe are um, relatively homogeneous and likely spherical, so ch chamber or SOA dominated systems. Um, and yeah, and then we can use RICE to apply for data point, data point uncertainty estimations in retrievals of our factor indexes from aerosols, for example, in a, a dynamic chamber study. And, then, and then lastly, I'd like to thank our funders as well as Charles A. Brock um, from NOAA, who um, wrote the original code that this kind of whole, both the me um, inverse me method is built around as well as RICE is built around. Yeah, I think that's it. That's all I got for you. Thanks, Alex, for a great talk. We'll give you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, so uh, now we have lots of time for questions. So feel free to put those in the chat or um, raise your hand. And uh, we'll, uh, Sam and I will alternate um, in calling on people or asking questions from the chat. Now let Sam go ahead first. Okay, I'm seeing if I'm going to give it a quick minute just to see if anything shows up in the chat. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry if I talk too fast. I always end up going faster doing the actual presentation. Again, so. No, I think you're right on where you said you were going to be. So. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, well, I just. I guess I have sort of a broad question of um, how uh, how well rice uh, helps reduce uncertainty uh, in refractive indices um, in light of those assumptions of homogeneity and sphericity. So, you know. Yeah. So, I guess we didn't build it um, in mind for ta like taking account. So like propagating, for example, if you knew you had a non-spherical particle, could you um, use it? Potentially, I mean, the same framework could be used where you're kind of doing your perturbed retrieval. Um, if you knew that your particles weren't quite shaped, you could potentially add, if, and if you knew the uncertainty that would add to retrievals um, or how it would affect your optical properties, you could add additional steps. Um, but at this time, we really built it for propagation of kind of these measurement uncertainties um, through the retrievals as people are currently doing them. Great, thank you. Um, I had a question. So I was wondering um, if you could talk to, if you thought about this, how um, much you think the this uh, metric of uncertainty will affect radiative forcing calculations? Um, so, I mean, I think, I mean, if we look um, just at like this, depending, it'll depend on how people have been reporting uncertainties um, now versus then essentially. So for this, um, we look at the min-max method. Generally, RICE seems to give slightly lower values here for the N specifically. Um, and so how that propagates into scattering and absorption 
isn't quite one to one for refractive index value to um, actual radio of effects or scattering of a given particle. Um, but there does seem to be some bias here that potentially you could um, either increase the certainty of those radiation for forcing measurement estimates or decrease it based on what you know. So maybe you can do a bit more of a stochastic massive new radio model um, to allow for increased uncertainty in these values, for example. So I think it really where it comes in is it helps us on the front end. So people are pulling values from the kind of lab work literature that they're not um, overly confident or underly confident in these values. And so. Thanks. That makes well, sense. I, I haven't seen any questions in the chat. There are some uh, congratulations and such. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, and quickly, I guess this, I, it may have been in the paper. I may have missed it. Um, when iterating through these, uh, the different parameters, is it when you're choosing one, are you then, you, are you then replacing it? Um, is it? You no, know, so I guess we're do, using, so it's, we're doing for each one of those like potentially true refractive indexes, you do a series of retrievals. And so if I do 10 retrievals, I now have um, 10 retrievals that are now associated with 10 different um, solutions. And so I look at how those retrievals are distributed, for example. Um, and I look at how many of those gave me that target value. Um, so if that original value I want to know the uncertainty about. And so I can say, okay, um, this, value I'm interested in gave me that value 10% of the time um, for this case. And all these other values gave it to me 0% of the time. Um, so this value is the most likely one, for example. And so we used all that that information to then um, kind of produce a probability distribution there. Is that clear, cool. kind of? Yeah, no, that makes more sense. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I well, if we don't have any more questions, we'll give you one more thank you. And this is really interesting. Yeah, no, thank you guys for hosting. I really appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. Have a good rest of the week, everyone. Yeah, you too. Yeah, oh yeah, and quickly, um, I guess, assuming that the date and time is actually pinned down, next month's uh, seminar will be on uh, May 20th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, just so everyone is aware of that. Sounds great. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it.